This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. In the name of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. For me, one of the real tastes of summer is a juicy, firm, sweet, and tasty peach. You know the kind you bite into in the peach? Juice runs down your chin. That's why I brought a napkin. It's just really about the last couple of weeks we've had the real item. This one says South Carolina on the little tag on it. So it's a real American peach. I tell my wife, don't buy fruit that's not in season. But she does anyways, because of course the supermarket packages it, and you can buy fruit in any season. You can buy peaches all through the year, but those mealy, dry things that go for peaches just aren't the same as a real peach. And we have them now into, into September. Fresh, locally grown fruit tastes so much better, so much more real. It's something that has grown hundreds or probably thousands of miles away, shipped to the supermarket and racked in plastic for consumers. The Apostle Paul tells us that some people manifest the fruits of the Spirit. And he names them love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when you know someone who manifests one or more of those spiritual fruits, it's like that first peach of summer. It's a joy to be around such a person. Think of someone you know who is particularly kind. Who's the most patient person you know? Can you imagine working for the most patient person you know? Someone whose patience would give you freedom to grow and develop your skills? Who do you know who is generous to a fault? Just visited a niece who uh, works for a fundraising company and, and she, her, her job is finding people like that. Do you know anyone who is always dependable and faithful? Who do you know is exceptionally peaceful, who's never ruffled or disturbed by events or problems? Who do you know who is exceptionally disciplined? Who is the most loving person you know? Who is the most gentle? Who is the most joy-filled? One of the most joyful persons I know always has a sparkle in her eyes. She brings out the joy in others and always brightens up a room just by her presence. Whenever I see her, I almost feel a shared laughter that's ready to, on the verge of escaping from both of our lips. And yet this joyful woman suffers Severe, severe bouts of depression. She's been hospitalized because she was afraid that if she weren't, she would commit suicide. She continues in therapy to this day. Her sense of joy has come particularly by working through her own deep grief and loss. And she works effectively as a grief counselor listening and supporting others who have lost someone dear to them. So manifesting a fruit of the Spirit doesn't necessarily come easily. Every one of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul lists, all seven of them, is, is much a faithful practice, a kind of discipline, as much or even more than a natural gift. None of the fruits of the Spirit's can be achieved in an instant. They're cultivated and hard won, requiring years to develop. While different people are particularly good at one or another, each of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul identifies are available to us. Could you imagine if we can only be kind but we couldn't love? If we could have self-discipline but we couldn't be generous? I mean, that would be ridiculous. Each of the fruits of the Spirit are available to all of us. 
And no matter how well one person manifests one of them, there is always room for improvement. No one ever says, ah yes, now that I've mastered love, I'm ready to work on developing my skills and patience. <coughs> it takes many years to develop an orchard. Fruit trees have to mature for at least three years after planting before they actually develop fruit. The right mix of fertilizer, weather, rain, and sunshine is required. The blossoms must be properly pollinated. One must wait until the fruit is ripe, but not wait too long until it's overripe and easily bruised. Fruits of the spirit, like the fruits that grow on bushes and trees, need to be patiently grown. In contrast to the fruits of the spirit, Paul talks about the works of the flesh. Paul is not contrasting the physical versus spiritual. He's not that dualist. It's not flesh versus spirit in terms of flesh as body. Sarx, the Greek word for flesh, could equally be translated self-indulgence. Every one of Paul's lists of fleshly or self-indulgent behaviors can be seen as mis a misguided or disordered virtue. Mark Douglas, a professor of Christian ethics, writes that Paul's problem with the flesh is not what it desires, but that its desires are disordered. It wants the wrong things or wants good things in the wrong way, usually too much or too little. Wanting sexual intimacy, it pursues fornication or pornography. Wanting contact with the divine, it pursues, pursues idols. Wanting joy, it carouses. Connecting this point to Paul's emphasis on freedom suggests that disordered desires enslave us to our passions and destroy community. Unlike the fruits of the spirit, that need to be developed and practiced over time. The works of the flesh are indulgences one gravitates to its quick fixes and easy solutions. These contrasting lists of fruits of the spirit and works of the flesh illustrate the proper and improper use of freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. The works of the flesh come out of misuse of our freedom. They're like the 16-year-old taking the car out for a spin for the first time on his or her own, driving too fast, ending up in a ditch. Or the college student, free for the first time from mom and dad's control, partying so hard that somehow the grades were forgotten. Throughout the letter to the Galatians, Paul makes clear that it is by God's grace alone that we have been set free, both from law and guilt. Jesus, of course, atoned for our sins, dying for us on a cross. And that was, that is a free gift, totally unearned and undeserved. We're not required to live a certain way or produced a certain kind of fruits in order to be given that gift, in order for God to love us and forgive us. We don't have to earn God's love. But at the same time, Paul makes clear that freedom comes with an ethical cost. The first verse that we had in today's epistle for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He continues that theme in verses 13 through 14. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot live into God's love apart from loving our neighbor as ourself. Anything short of loving our neighbor becomes self-indulgent, a work of the flesh. Perfect freedom is lived into only through service. See, that's that weird contradiction in Scripture, seeming contradiction, that paradox. We only find freedom through a kind of servitude. 
So Paul uses strong and contradictory language when he writes through love becomes slaves to one another. The great gift of our Christ-given freedom is fulfilled and practiced only through that servitude, which is crazy. Freedom is discovered only through servitude. But if you've ever learned freedom in Christ, have given that gift and entered into it, you know it's true. I remember my first semester in college, living away from home for the first time. In high school, I had been, at best, an indifferent student. And if it weren't for some pretty good SAT scores, I probably wouldn't have been able to get into the college of my choice. My pattern at home was for my mother to nag me to finish my assignments until the 11th hour at the deadline when I would work feverishly to get it done. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy learning. I did. But I was terribly undisciplined about, it, about my studies and resisted being pushed. So starting college, I was glad to get away from home and have the freedom to be on my own. Somewhere around the middle of the first semester, after I had done poorly on a, on a, on a paper I'd written and uh, um, some test scores I had in a history class that I particularly loved, I think it was the history of ancient Egypt and Greece, covered a lot of ground at the time. And I was frustrated with those grades, and it was about then that it hit me. I was on my own. My mother wasn't there to push me. No one was nagging me if I were to write a paper or study. It was totally up to me. Every good habit I've developed since as a student and most of what I've learned academically began in my dorm room right that night with the discovery that if I wanted to learn anything at all, it was entirely up to me. That's when I began to discover what Paul means by freedom. I had the freedom to work if I wanted something. If I didn't, I wouldn't have it when I wanted. Pauling, Paul is telling us to use our freedom not for self-indulgence, but for love of neighbor, for others, and not for self. He says something like this, you now have total license to go crazy with good works. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. There's absolutely no regulation about having too much joy. Go ahead, be joyful. There's no, no law against being too patient. No reason you shouldn't show excessive generosity. Go ahead, Paul says, knock yourself out. There's no law against it. When was the last time you ran up to someone and said, would you stop please being so loving? <laughs> so joyful, so patient, so peaceful, so kind? Of course, you'd never say such a thing because you'd want more of them. You'd be enjoying and loving. On the other hand, Maybe no one would say such a thing to us because all too often we're too timid in sharing those wonderful fruits of the Spirit with others. The more we use our freedom for others, the more the Spirit works in us to grow those delicious, juicy, wonderful fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which one of those blessed fruits of the Spirit, those blessed practices, is the Holy Spirit inviting you to develop more fully in your life and in your relationships? Like a farmer in this abundant time of year, shouldn't we work with the Holy Spirit to grow, to harvest and share more of those fruits of the Spirit in our lives? 